lead us with this song. Son, may call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my freedom. An empty grave is there. My Savior lives Because He lives I can face tomorrow Because He lives Amen All fear is gone Because I know He holds a future Just because he lives How sweet to hold A newborn baby And feel the pride And the joy he gives But greater still The calm assured this child can face uncertain times because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. The living just because he lives. Praise glory. And then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as day gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone holds a future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Hallelujah! Thank you, Brother Jack. God's word in Acts chapter 4. I can't see because I teared up again. <laughs> okay. Um, in Acts 4, verse 11, it reads This Jesus, the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people 
by which you must be saved. Let's stand and sing together. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen. And wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years until the past to disappear. Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could. Who can work it all for your good? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus, and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen, amen. You take the cross of Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty. Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus, oh. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me let me tell you about my jesus and let my jesus change your life hallelujah 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 amen amen hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah, let my Jesus change your life. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you about my Jesus. My Bible says that my Jesus is the King of Kings. Amen. My Bible says that Jesus is the Lord of Lords. My Jesus said that if anybody's thirsty and they'll come to Him, He'll give them water that will make them never thirst again. If you're here this morning, I don't typically do this, but if you're here this morning and you don't know for sure where you'll spend eternity, I want you to think about that through this service this morning. And please don't leave here without knowing. I heard a preacher say this morning, he says, this is a delivery room and somebody needs to be born again. Amen. Woo! I'm ready to preach, y'all. But we got some more good music coming. And we're glad that you're here. I've got a few announcements I want to share for you, but with you. But first of all, if you are visiting with us this morning, I'm kind of staticky a little bit, I think. Is that, what's that? This, this mic? Can we turn off the pulpit mic? Is that better? All right. There we go. Let's try this again. We're glad that you're here with us. If you got a bulletin when you came in today, there's a tear-off on the back of it. You can just tear that off, fill it out, drop it in an offering plate as it comes by. 
Give it to one of our ushers as you leave so that we can get some information from you and we can connect with you throughout this week and just tell you again thank you for coming. We've got a few things we want to share with you uh, today that I've got on this list and that's um, diapers, formula, oh, there, I wrote some grocery list on this, I'm sorry, no, no, no. We've got some stuff coming up uh, May 5th, the Joy Group will meet and they will be leading us. To laugh at that, but uh, we're, they'll be doing that, and then uh, then the food will be Mexican food that evening, and then May 24th, the women's meeting, uh, they'll meet, and then there's other uh, announcements there in the bulletin that we're trying to direct our traffic and the attention there so we don't spend as much time up here and take away from the service, so look in that bulletin, look at some stuff there, but one thing we want to make mention of is the last Sunday of this month. And that gives you an entire month to invite people. We have the privilege to have the Irwins here with us. The Irwins are a Southern Gospel group, uh, younger. They're all close to my age. And so uh, they live just down the road from us. And Keith, the oldest brother, reached out to me and asked about coming and, and blessing us. So we're going to let them do that service that morning. But we're also going to have baptisms that Sunday again. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, praise the Lord. So we'll have baptisms that Sunday morning. They're going to lead us, and then immediately following that service, we're going to have a picnic. It's kind of a kick-off-the-summer picnic. We'll have hamburgers and hot dogs on the grill. So invite somebody. We're going to have the, the concert back there, and then we'll have the grill set up outside. And, and we're, it's going to be a great time of fellowship. Amen? Well, Yes, sir. May, May 29th. Yes, sir. Last Sunday of this month. It's May, y'all. Can you believe that? I cannot wait for May the 4th because May the 4th be with you. That's right. All right, here we go. Well, let's pray over the offering. I'm so glad to see you here this morning. Are you excited to be at church? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you thankful that we get to worship in your house today. Father, we are glad that we can come into a place and freely worship you, God, without the fear of being arrested. God, that this is not illegal. Father, I pray that we don't take this for granted, Lord, that we come here and we fill this place with the sounds of praise that reach your throne room. God, I want to ask specifically two things this morning, that if there's anyone here today that does not know you, that they would make that right before they leave this place today. God, as we're not guaranteed tomorrow, Lord, eternity hangs in the balance. God, the second thing I want to ask you this morning is that if anyone came in here with distractions that would hinder them from worshiping you, God, worshiping the sovereign, almighty, merciful, gracious God that you are today, that they would remove those distractions. God, that we would take the focus off of us, that we would take the focus off of whatever's going on around us, God, and we would give you this hour, God, in the grand scheme of eternity, the hour we spend on Sunday morning almost seems insignificant. But Lord, I pray that we would take this hour, God, that we would remove any distractions. Lord, that if there's anyone here this morning that has a distraction, that any time in this service they feel the need, God, that they would come put that at this altar. Lord, if they need to come down here before the preaching even gets started, if they need to come down here while the singing is taking place to say, God, remove the distractions. And if it's me that would prevent you from moving today, God, remove that distraction from my life so that you can have full reign of this place today. God, I can't help but believe that you want to do something very big in this service today. And as others have said already, I feel like you're already here and you're waiting to move, God. And you're just waiting on us to say, God, we surrender. So, Father, our prayer this morning is as the old hymn goes, I surrender all. I surrender all. Lord, I pray that you would bless this offering as our ushers prepare to take it. Lord, that you would bless it to the ongoing of your work, that you would further your kingdom with it. But, Lord, that you would also bless those who are obedient and giving. Lord, sacrificially, maybe it's not sacrificially, but they're still giving to your work. 
Lord, may we not get bogged down in the thought that I'm just giving to keep the light bill on. I'm just giving to keep the water running. Lord, no, it's so much more than that. God, we are giving to further your kingdom. Scripture is very clear that giving is as much a part of worship as the singing and the preaching. So Lord, as we set this time aside to collectively, as one body, as one group, as one voice, worship you today. Lord, our prayer is that it would fill your throne room with the sweet praises of your people. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is I spend in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me. Blazing sun shall tears 
Jesus invites me to call Him Father, only a holy God, only my holy God. Come and be wanting the one and the only God.
Can we just turn the pulpit mic off? All right. How about that? Is that better? All right. I don't know about y'all, but I've always said when the Spirit of God falls on a church, I don't know if we would know what to do with it. He's here this morning, guys. What I'm going to ask you to do, that's a little bit unusual, I want to spend just a minute or so with you and the Lord. If you need to come up here, you can. You can stay right where you are. And I just want to ask you to, to cry out to God right now that whatever's going on in this service would not be quenched. Amen. That if it's a distraction in your life, if it's something that you've got against somebody, whatever it is, I don't know. I don't know where you're at. I really don't. But let's spend about a minute, minute and a half, and I'll close that time in prayer and then we'll get into the sermon. So let's spend some time with the Lord. Father, we come to you this morning acknowledging that you came to church today. <laughs> Father, I believe that we have been seeking this. Lord, we've been calling on you to show up and to show out. Amen. Father, I don't think there's anyone in this place today that would question whether or not your presence is here. God, this is not something that any one of us, God, the pastor, the deacons, the, the leadership of our church could manufacture. Lord, quite honestly, we don't really know what to do with it. But God, we cry out to you this morning and ask that you don't leave. Amen. Lord, it burdens me, it, it breaks my heart that in my 25 short years on this earth, I've never seen a collective move of your spirit on your people. God, as I read history books of when Billy Graham got saved and when revivals would break out and pastors would stand in the river for hours and hours baptizing people that came to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. God, where is that? Lord, we, we've gotten so bogged down in the programs and the, the, the personalities of church. Lord, we've played church too long. Amen. God, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning that's just here to play church, that you would bring them under conviction, Lord, that you would show them that the church is a hospital for sick sinners. Lord, it's not a country club. It's not a social gathering of the, the town's most elite. God, it's where your people congregate to lift up your name collectively. Amen. Father, I admit to you this morning that I am feeble, I am weak, I am human. And God, as Paul said, I'm the least qualified to be doing what you've called me to do. God, I believe that would go for everyone in this room, but we thank you. That you don't call the qualified, but you qualify the call. Amen. Father, we want to come to you again and ask that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that, that maybe has struggled and, and veered off, Lord, that you would bring them back to you. Lord, if they're not saved, that you would bring them to yourself to begin with. Amen. 
God, we don't know why you chose to show up at church here this morning, but we thank you for doing it. Lord, we pray that this becomes an everyday thing, not an every week thing, but an everyday thing. Lord, that if there's anyone here that's got anger in their heart towards someone else, God, if they're holding bitterness or resentment, that before we leave this place today, they've made that right. Your word says that where the brothers and the sisters dwell in unity, you'll be there. Lord, you say that it's good and it's pleasant for us to dwell in unity together. Amen. Lord, I believe for your spirit to move collectively on this body, we must be unified. God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your holiness that we just sang about, for your sovereignty that called us to repentance. God, for your mercy that saved us whenever we were not deserving of your grace. Amen. God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to save wretches like us. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you, and we give you this service. Have your way in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, and before you think, <laughs> Judd, you've read this already, I know. I have. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, give this catapult, this springboard for the New Testament church. Peter's preaching and a revival breaks out and the Spirit of God falls on this place and some things start to happen. Pretty neat stuff and it's a revival and the church uh, is ushered into where we see it today, the biblical New Testament church. And so I want to read that to you as our base text and you'll remember that uh, Acts 2.47 is our theme verse for the year that the Spirit of God draws people to Himself and people get saved. And it says that uh, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. And so our each one, reach one initiative for the year comes from this verse specifically. But I want to read it and then I want to share some thoughts with you this morning. If you're there, say amen. amen. Acts chapter 2. Verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread. And in prayers, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. 46, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In 1961, the famous football coach Vince Lombardi, the coach for the Green Bay Packers, walks into the locker room on the first day of training. July of 1961, just a few months after the Green Bay Packers had lost within minutes and just a few points by winning the Super Bowl. This group of 38 professional athletes are gathered there ready to start training camp. And this coach walks in and he grabs a football out of the football bag. And he walks up in front of all the church, all of the, the training camp, and he holds the football up and he says, Gentlemen, this is a football. Please stop me if I'm moving too fast for you. <laughs> Coaches and players across the league said that Lombardi's methodical approach to the fundamental elements of the game are what led the Green Bay Packers to success. In fact, six months later, the Green Bay Packers go to the Super Bowl and they defeat the New York Giants 27 to nothing. Lombardi's leadership and, and his goal and his drive was to take each player from the quarterback to the water boy and remind them and instill in them the fundamental elements of the game of football. I would like to submit to you this morning that the church, the Western civilized evangelical church, has strayed very far from the fundamental elements of the New Testament church. 
You say, what are you talking about, Judd? How can you say that? Well, I have a little proof here for you. ABC gathered some statistics from Protestant church groups, evangelical church groups across the nation. And since March of 2020, 45% of churchgoers have stopped going to church. That's right, 45%. The decrease in church attendance since March of 2020 is 45%. Evangelicals no longer hold the majority in society. What does that mean? That means that for years and years, we barely scratch by by the skin of our teeth at 51 to 52 percent of evangelicals going to church and claiming to be church. Now the number falls below half that America is unchurched. They don't go to church and they don't have a desire to go to church. 45% since this pandemic started. And what I hear over and over and over again whenever I ask people, do you go to church anywhere? Well, I don't like when they start with that word. Because what follows almost every single time is this. I used to go to so and so. And now I don't because it's so easy for me to get up. They're online. Our services are online. And thank God for online. Thank God for digital media that through a pandemic when we couldn't gather that we could reach people. But those days are over. And I hear it over and over and over again. It's just easier for me, preacher, to put on my night clothes and sit on my couch and eat pancakes and watch the church service. It's actually been given that name, the pancake era of church. Did you know that? Because you can leave your PJs on, you can sit on your couch or in your bed, and you can watch church on TV from any church that you would like to pick. Granted, there are far, far, far better preachers out there than your pastor. There are far bigger churches with a lot fancier programs out there than we have here. But I'm here to tell you nothing beats the gathering of brothers and sisters fellowshipping and breaking bread with one another in a local church body. Listen to me, folks. 45% of people have quit coming to church because the fundamental elements are not being taught and preached from the pulpit today. One preacher said it this way. He said, my fear is that we have spent too much time teaching people what they're saved from and not teaching people what they're saved for. You see, I can get up here and I can pound the pulpit and I can say, turn or burn, because Jesus is coming back. We're in the end times and I can scare you to death and I can manipulate and, and, and manufacture a decision that's built on strictly nothing but emotion. But I cannot teach you enough that we were saved not by good works, but for good works, to do good works. Listen to me, folks. I'm going to make a statement that's going to shock some of you. And this is the statement. The church is not for lost people. You've got a very blank look on your face right now. You say, what do you mean, preacher? What do you mean the church is not for lost people? In saying that the church is for lost people, we have developed this mindset that lost people come, they stay lost, they leave lost, they come back lost, there's no conviction of their sin because we've made it too comfortable for sinners to live in sin. Listen to me, the church is not to judge people, we're not to look down our noses at people, but we are to preach the full countenance of God's word so that people are convicted of their sin and lost people don't come to church to stay lost. They come here, they get saved, they get plugged into this body and now we hold each other accountable by the word of God and we say, hey, brother, hey, sister, I think you're out of line because God's word says that. It's not judgmental, it's holding each other accountable. The church is a hospital for sick folks and it's a training ground for saved folks. How many of you in this building, by a show of hands this morning, want to go to a hospital sick as a dog and leave sick as a dog? <laughs> I didn't think so. You see, when you go to a hospital, you go looking for healing. You go looking for a, a cure. You go looking for some sort of medicine, some sort of anecdote that will, will help you be better. But what we've done in culture and in society today is say, hey... What would make you happy coming to church? 
if we have the donuts and coffee ready for you, will you be excited to come to church? If we have comfortable pews, will you be excited to come to church? If we have a, a, a really fancy auditorium, will you be excited to come to church? Listen to me, folks. Can I drop by your house and deliver some mail this morning? If the word of God being preached is not enough to make you want to come to church, well, this could be the wrong place. Well, I want to do something this morning, and we don't have a ton of time, and so we're going to take some time this morning to look at a text in 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you'll turn over there with me this morning. We're going to start a series that over the next few weeks we're going to look at the fundamental elements of the New Testament church. Back to the basis is what we're calling this. And before you think that I'm an uneduc uneducated, uh, uh, ignorant hillbilly, this probably won't change your mind. <laughs> but I, I believe, and I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. One time, turns out I, I was mistaken. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can't say amen, got to say oh me, right? <laughs> but before you think, oh, he meant to say basics, and he said basis. No, I said basis because I feel like whenever we use the word basic, we throw our minds into cruise control. Right. When we hear the word basic, we think, well, I know all this stuff, Judd. I've been in church my whole life. I know the church thing, and that's the problem. Too many of us know the church thing, and we don't know the fundamental practices of how church should be. And so we're going to go back to the basis. Webster says that basis is the foundation, the reason, and the, the why of what we do, or why we do what we do. That's the basis. And so we're going to go back to the basis. And I want to point out something, and, and these are not in any particular order, but the reason we read Acts chapter 2 is because I believe you find every one of the fundamental elements that we're going to look at over the next three to four weeks in that text. And so they're not in any specific order, but I wanted to do this one first because I believe this one is of most importance and the other ones won't be in any specific order, okay? And that's Scripture. The authority, the infallibility, and the sufficiency of the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. This book is a unique book. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, This book is a unique book. I want you to turn to that same neighbor and say, You didn't brush your teeth this morning, did you? I love church, y'all. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Go there with me if you will. Starting in verse 16, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, All Scripture, that word all is very unique in the Greek, it means all, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Oh, amen. This book is a very unique book book. In fact, Voltaire, the 18th century philosopher in France, got up and very arrogantly made a statement that the Word of God, the Bible, would be obsolete and totally irrelevant within a hundred years. Arrogantly, he made that statement very proud in front of a group of followers who had gathered there to hear him speak. In a sovereign twist of events, Voltaire dies and since he had had such a worldly, global impact with his philosophy and his studies and his teaching and his talking, they decided, France decided, that they would auction off his house. So they opened up this auction for the public to come in, and the ones that bought his house, when the gavel fell and the auctioneer said sold, it was the French Bible Translation Society. And for the next many years, hundreds and thousands of Bibles were written and translated in the house of the man that said within a hundred years the Bible will be irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. This book, friends, is a very unique book. 
What makes this book so unique? What makes this book so special that you go into a hospital and it's by the bedside? You go into a hotel and it's in the nightstand. You go into the home of people that you didn't even know went to church and it's there on the kitchen table and it's preached from pulpits around the world and we just can't seem to get away from it. It's in businesses. It's everywhere. What makes this book so unique? I believe Paul answers that here in this text. That this book is a very unique book. We've got a long way to go and a very little time to get there. So jump in with me if you will. Paul starts off by saying all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All. That means everything from Genesis to Revelation. God divinely inspired it and He breathed His words through people to write His words. Some scholars say, well, you can't say that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And my question for those scholars is, who decides what's inspired and what's not? You cannot tell me that God's sovereign hand was not all over the writing of His Word because 1,600 years and 40 different authors all point to one thing, and that's Jesus Christ. Without contradiction. From the genealogies to the historical books to the prophets to the, the poetry to the apostles' letters to the, to the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to the church letters, to the pastoral epistles, God's hand was on it. But not only God's hand was on it, God's breath was in it. Oh, Three things I want you to keep in mind if you're taking notes. You can write these down. There's a place on the back of the bulletin if you've got a pen. You can write these down. The thing that sets this book apart that makes it so special are three things Paul points out. And the first thing is it's divine inspiration. It's divine inspiration. Listen to what happens when God speaks. Genesis 1, God speaks and He hangs the world in its place. He hangs the moon and the stars and the sun and, and all of the things that we see today. He spoke them into place. He breathed out. And the worlds existed. Amen. When God speaks, big things happen. In Exodus 3, God speaks to Moses through a burning bush that was not consumed, yet it was burning. And He said, Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. When God speaks, big things happen. In the book of Jonah, God comes to Jonah and He says, go to Nineveh and tell them to repent or I'm going to destroy their city. And so Jonah says, no God, I don't want to do that. And he ends up spending a little weekend vacation in the belly of a big fish. Yeah. The whale spits him up and Jonah says, okay God, I'll go because you told me to go. And he goes and he preaches the gospel and he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn from your wicked ways so that God will hear from heaven and heal your land. And Nineveh experiences a revival like never before. Listen to me. When God speaks, big things happen. Amen. Go with me a little uh, further down the road to a place called Germany. A young man named Martin Luther who devoted his life to being a monk. Who devoted his life to hoping that good works would get him to heaven. That hoping his good would outweigh his bad. And he sits there in tears one night and he reads Romans chapter 1 verse 17 where it says the just shall live by faith and God calls him to repentance and he goes and he hangs the problems he has with the Catholic church there for everyone to see ushering in a reformation and a revival that broke out there in Wittenberg, Germany. Go with me to England to a young man by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was called on to speak at the Crystal Auditorium in the 19th century. And it was to be the biggest, biggest speech that Spurgeon would ever give. As this place would be packed out, the auditorium would be full. And in a pre-microphone era, they called on Spurgeon to go and check the acoustics in the Crystal Auditorium. <coughs> Nervous, he walks behind the pulpit to check these acoustics and he simply quotes from John 1.29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Again, with that booming voice, he said that verse again. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Mr. Spurgeon, would you say it one more time a little louder for the people in the back? Behold the Lamb of God 
that takes away the sins of the world. And unbeknownst to Charles Spurgeon, a custodian in the balcony cleaning up trash, falls on his face, repents of his sins, and he's saved. Listen to me, folks. You cannot play with the fire of God's Word without getting burned. Oh, man. This book is unique because of its divine inspiration. Forty authors, 1,600 years, and they all point to one thing, Jesus. That word I told you about Easter Sunday is a compound word used one time in the Bible. And it's a word that scholars believe that Paul himself crafted. It's a compound word. Theo, Theo, God, and Neustos. It's the word we get uh, pneumatic. Wind, air, Theo, God, Neustos, breathed out. The Word of God is breathed out by God. Listen to me, folks. There's a lot of good books out there. Leonard Ravenhill's Why Revival Tarries is an incredible book, but God didn't breathe on that book. A.W. Pink's Concise Theology is an incredible book, but listen to me. God didn't breathe out on that book. He breathed out on this one. Where we get in trouble is where we spend more time reading books about the book than the book itself. Amen. Folks, where were you when this book got into you? I'm telling you, you cannot play with the fire of God's Word without getting burned. I remember where I was. I was eight years old, and my dad had preached a sermon from Romans, and it said that all have sinned, and I realized that that all was talking about me. And I was broken at eight years old and realized that if I was to continue on the path that I was going, I would spend an eternity in hell separated from God. I'll never forget in Centerville, Texas on a cold December night, I took my dad by the hand and we went into my bedroom and I sat down on the floor and I said, Daddy, I'm going to hell. I said, Daddy, I'm lost. I'm that all that's fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6 says that the payment, the wages, the rightful thing that I deserve for that is death and separation from God in a place called hell. And I don't want to be about that life. And I took my dad by the hand and I cried out to God to save me. And it was as real nearly 20 years ago as it is today. When this book got into me, folks, it transformed everything about me. It's divinely inspired, and that's what sets it apart and makes it so unique. The second thing, we're moving through this, that Paul points out. He says that it's inspired, it's theonoustos, it's breathed out by God. But then he says it's unique because of its distinct instruction. It's set apart because of its specific guidelines in righteous living. You may say, Judd, why in the world are you rehashing all of this? I'm rehashing all of this because, folks, if we cannot stand on the authority and the instruction of God's Word, we have nothing else to stand on. Businesses have guidelines. Businesses have mission statements. Businesses have a way of doing things, a policy and procedure handbook, if you will. And, folks, this here is the policy and procedure handbook for the church. Because of its distinct instruction. What is its distinct instruction? Look what he says. He says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Therefore, it is profitable. That means it's good for. It is good for these following things. Listen to what he says. Doctrine, reproof, correction, and uh, training or instruction in righteousness. That word doctrine, it's where we get the things that we practice and the things that are preached from the pulpit. He says it's good for that. You take your doctrine from here, not some YouTube evangelist. This is where we get the basis for why we believe what we believe. He, Paul says that it's good for that. It's divinely inspired and God's word is enough. Second thing for reproof. This is a word that we don't really like. It's a word that we may not be very familiar with. But it is to call out each other in righteousness according to God's word. Whenever you hear of a a marriage falling apart or you hear of a wayward child or you hear of someone just simply living out of line, we can't go to them and say, well, I think this is what I think. No, no. 
I'm here to tell you that if you ever come into my office for counsel on any situation, the counsel that I give you will come from this book. Amen. It will not come from a counselor's handbook or a, a, a guide to counseling for dummies, although I am a dummy. It will come from the Word of God. And I am heartbroken and I'm saddened that there are people out there who go under the name of Christian counselor, Christian psychiatrist, Christian this, Christian that, and they do everything separate from the Word of God. Paul says it's sufficient for reproof to call people to repentance, to live in the way that we were called to live. But then he says, correction, that it's, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. I, I, I was talking to Miss Ruby's grandson this morning. I didn't ask his permission to share this, but it made me think of this. He's got braces, and he's got really cool colors in his braces. They're blue, and he was telling me about all the colors that, that he's had. And all of my siblings just about have had braces. And what they say is when they go in there and they get their braces, it hurts. And, and sometimes you can't see the braces on there depending on how the lips are formed. But they're in there and they're working to correct a problem. They're working to bring the teeth together straighter. But listen to me, folks. I've never had them. I've never experienced it personally. But I hear tell, braces hurt. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Braces are not comfortable. They're painful. They hurt. But after a year, two, three years, you get the braces off. People look at it and they say, there's a change in your teeth. That's what the Word of God is for, folks. There will be Sundays that I get up here and I preach a sermon and you get so excited and, and you may even want to hang my picture in the hallway for a week or so because that was just a, a great encouraging word. But folks, if I am committed to preaching the full countenance of God's word, there will be Sundays that you don't want to speak to me whenever we walk out the door. In fact, you want to vote me out and demand my resignation because the word of God not only encourages and teaches, but that correction hurts at times. But Paul says it's good for that. But the last thing he says is that it is good for instruction in righteousness. Listen to me. A lot of people will put this book on their nightstand. They'll put this book on their table. And they have a form of godliness. But they're not godly internally. And it's because they do not get in this book. And they don't allow this book to get in them. Your success in Christianity. Hear me out. When I say success, I don't mean that you're making six figures a year. Your success, and by that, I mean if you're walking with the Lord and you are being sanctified day in and day out and you are just coming up with this, this joy and this fulfillment in the things of God will be because of your willful submission to allow this book to get in you. It is not good enough to leave this book on your nightstand every day. You have to get into the Word of God and allow it to penetrate you. Get on your knees. Get alone with God every day. If you can't get on your knees, that's fine. Just get alone with God. Say, God, teach me something from your Word today that I didn't know before I studied it today. And you will be amazed at what God reveals to you through His Word. This book has distinct instruction. I've got blood pressure medicine I've told some of you about before. And I'm really terrible at taking medication. I just am. And the doctor said that I needed this medication to keep my blood pressure down and to regulate things. And so I keep that bottle of lisinopril up in the cabinet. And whenever I think about it, I'll go take some. <laughs> but I'm telling you that that medicine is doing me absolutely no good sitting on the shelf in my house. When it does the good is when I take it off the shelf and I open that lid and I put it in my mouth and I swallow it and I allow it to get into my bloodstream to bring my blood pressure down. That is whenever you see the effectiveness of 10 milligrams of lisinopril. Listen to me. You will not see the effectiveness of God's Word until you allow it to get in you. It's divine, distinct instruction sets it apart from any other book. There are some great books out there that teach us how to have a better life, how to have 
have a better marriage, how to make more money. But listen to me, you'll find those things in this book and it comes straight from God. Amen. It's distinct instruction, but lastly, and we're done, is it's direct intention. What is the Word of God intended to do? What makes it so special? He says in verse 17 that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is such an interesting uh, word, exercise, exartizo in the Greek. It's where we get our word exercise so that men can be equipped thoroughly for every good work. When I was growing up, I played baseball. I loved baseball from the time I could walk. I still love it, but now I can't hardly walk, so I can't hardly play. And so every day whenever I was playing, I would pay my brother to pitch to me to let me take batting practice. I would pay my brother to hit ball after ball after ball off of a tee, and I would take three to 400 ground balls every day because I wanted to be thoroughly equipped for the position I played at shortstop. I wanted to be faster. I wanted the ball to come out of my glove and into my hand and across to first base faster. I wanted to be able to feel the ball and turn a double play faster. And so I worked every single day to the point where my hands would bleed. My feet would be blistered. I was just give out, but I enjoyed it because I knew it was equipping me thoroughly to fulfill that position I was playing. The Bible says that the Word of God is to equip people to be able to fulfill that position of Christianity thoroughly. But if it's not getting in you, folks, you're not being equipped. Paul uses an interesting word here. Typically in the Old Testament, it's referred to as the people of God. But here and one other place in the pastoral epistles, Paul refers and he calls out the man of God. I'm going to close by moving in close to the men in this room this morning. It's been said that societies will rise and fall on the backs of the leadership of men. This is not to be sexist. This is simply to state the facts. Statistics have shown that the odds are so much greater, they're almost double, whenever the man of the house brings his family to church and he is saved and he leads by example. Bridget. When the wife does it, it's about half. And when the kids do it, it's about a quarter. Listen to me, men. Paul calls us out to be the spiritual leaders of our homes. To wake up not only on Sunday morning and say today we're going to go to church, but Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, Friday and Saturday to wake up and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Listen to me, men. We are seeing a society crumble around us. And I fear that it is as a result of spineless men in this country that don't have a backbone, that will not stand up and say, what's wrong is wrong and what's right is right. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and we're not going to partake in what the world says we're going to partake in. You say it's a whole lot easier, Judd, to go with the flow. Can I move real close to you and, and lovingly say, be a man? Amen. It is so easy to go with the flow of the world. It is so easy to let somebody else take care of your family. It is so easy to just let the world come into your home and take charge of what you should be in charge of. You want to be a man. Don't do what the world says you should do. You want to be a man? Go against the grain. Go against the flow. You may say, Judd, I'm, I'm far removed from having a family at home. Maybe it's in your workplace. Maybe it's with your grandchildren. Maybe it's in your church. That it's time for you to stand up and say, I am a man of God that needs to be and will become thoroughly equipped to do the things of God. Amen. I'm closing with this story. And we're out of here. There's a story of a pastor <clears throat> who's a missionary down in the jungle regions in South America. and He was handing out Bibles. I've told this before to some of you on a Wednesday night. 
But he's passing out Bibles and they say, he says, I want to go up into the mountain, into that village, and I want to pass out Bibles. And they say, oh, preacher, you don't want to go up there. That place is dominated and it's ruled by drug lords. He said, I want to go up there. Those people haven't heard the gospel and they need it. Come on. And so he goes up into this little village up in the mountains and he starts handing out copies of God's word. He starts giving people Bibles. And this man comes out of a tent, a little clay hut of type of house. And he's this big man and he's mean and you can just see the evil in his eyes. And through a translator, he walks out and he says, what are you doing here? And he says, sir, I'm, I'm handing out Bibles. Would you take one? And this drug lord, is, it turns out to be, opens up the Bible and he starts flipping through those thin pages. And through his translator, he says, you know what that book would be good for? It would be good to smoke. He said, I could tear those pages out and I could smoke stuff in those pages. The preacher said, sir, I'll make a deal with you. If you promise me that you'll read the page before you smoke it, I'll give you this Bible. He sticks out his hand and he shakes his hand. He says, it's a deal. The preacher finishes his work there in the village and he goes back down the mountain and about two years later, year and a half to two years later, he's back in that same area. Somebody runs up to this preacher and they grab him and they say, preacher, preacher, you're not going to believe what's happened up in that village that we took Bibles to. And he says, what, what are you talking about? He says, we can't explain it. You've got to come see it for yourself. But revival has broke out. And so they grab their mules and their donkeys and they get on the donkeys and they ride up into the mountains and this man runs out of a tent and the preacher is a little bit startled because he runs and grabs him up and picks him up off of his feet and this, this big man says, Oh, preacher, I love you. And the preacher looks at him very startled and the man says, You don't recognize me, do you? He said, No, sir, I'm afraid I don't. He said, I'm the drug lord that you gave that Bible to years ago he says oh my word what happened he said preacher it's simple I made a deal with you I made a deal that I would read every page before I smoked it and I held up to that he said to be honest with you I smoked through Matthew <laughs> he said not only that I smoked through Mark he said then I smoked through Luke and he said but brother when I got to John it smoked me Amen. Listen to me, folks. This book is unique. It is divinely inspired. It has direct instructions. And it has distinct intentions for the people of God to live out righteousness. Would you bow your heads with me? I'm going to pray for us here. and What a powerful service that we've had this morning. It's not the preaching, not the singing, not the, the, the folks that gathered. It's because Jesus showed up at church today. But I want to ask you two questions. And we'll have this invitation time and then we'll close. One, where were you when the word of God got into you? When it got into your life and it radically transformed you and you went from Saul to Paul? where you gave your life to Jesus, where you repented of your sins and you put your faith and trust in Him and Him alone, the only one that can make sure you get to heaven. Where were you? Do you remember the time, the night, the day, the morning? Church camp, vacation Bible school, church. Maybe it was in your home. I want you to go back to that place and remember the sweetness and the relief that you experienced when you gave your life to Jesus. My second question is, for those that can't answer that question, has that ever happened to you? You may not can go back to a specific time and place and date, but can you go back to a time in your life where you had that transformation? Where you cried out to God and you said, God, forgive me of my sins. I'm putting my faith and trust in you. Can you go back to that place? I'm not going to call you out. We're not going to do the slip your hands up because nobody's looking around. That is a moment that is between you and God alone. But friends, my prayer and my request for you this morning, May 1st of 2022, is that you do not leave this place without being transformed by the Word of God. 
Listen to me, Jesus died so that you could have eternal life. There's a lot of you in this place that I love very dearly, that I know very well. But I don't know how many of you I would be with. Oh, let me rephrase that. There's not one of you in here that I would give up my son for. And God in His mercy and grace gave up His only Son so that you could have eternal life. I want to pray for you this morning. I'm going to ask you as the music begins to play, if you would stand to your feet, keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to pray for you. And as God leads you to come this morning, this altar is open. Father, God, we thank you for being here in this place today. Lord, we thank you for showing up and coming to church and moving on your people. God, we pray that this continues, that you'll continue to pour out your spirit and your favor here on this place. But God, I pray that you would give us such a love for your word. God, give us a love for the things that you have said are important. Because the world sure gives us a lot of things that they say are more important. God, I pray that you would challenge us, you would call us to live a life of holiness. God, I want to come to you again and ask you that if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, that's never made that right, that doesn't have a personal relationship with you, that they would not leave this place until they know for sure where they will spend eternity. Father, I want to call on you this morning and ask that the men in this room today would make it a priority to have their families in church. God, that they would make it a priority for themselves to be...